My name is Felix Yu. I'm one of the co-organizers for the summer school. I know I've only just arrived this morning, but I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. And we'll continue with Yael Shadmi, who will give her third lecture on amplitudes. Thank you, Felix. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I can say good to see you, but uh, I'll pretend. Um, um, I hope you slept well, because we have uh, a lot of work to do today. So uh, let's get started. Ah, I can see you now. Okay. Um, good. So uh, let me remind you what we said uh, at the end of uh, the lecture yesterday. So we talked about the uh, three point amplitudes of uh, three spin one massless particles. And we labeled them with some indices A, B, and C, because we said we have uh, a bunch of them. This, uh, uh, these indices go from one to N. And what we found was that the uh, amplitude was proportional to some uh, constant C, A, B, C that was totally anti-symmetric. And we said, this must be nothing but the structure constants F, A, B, C, uh, which are totally anti-symmetric under uh, the exchange of uh, any two indices. And we realized that what we're starting to see is the uh, structure of uh, Lie groups, because this is exactly what the uh, structure constants are for Lie groups. They're, uh, they have three indices and they're completely anti-symmetric. And if you remember what defines a Lie algebra is precisely these uh, structure constants. So in a Lie algebra, we have a set of generators and the commutator of T A T B is equal, but is equal to um, this I F A B C times T C. Um, this defines the algebra and these Fs have to satisfy the Jacobi identity that we're going to see a little later today. And together, the fact that um, these guys are totally anti-symmetric and they obey the, they satisfy the Jacobi identity, uh, that allows you to classify all the possible uh, FABCs and therefore all the possible simple Lie algebras. So here we're starting to see that just by looking at the interactions of uh, spin one massless particles. And this, this part we haven't seen yet, but we're going to see this today when we talk about uh, four-point amplitudes. Okay, another thing that we that kind of follows from this, and we already mentioned, is the fact that if we just look at uh, photons, so here there's no multiplicity, there's just a single guy. Uh, and in this case, this three-point amplitude uh, vanishes, and that's something that you probably seen uh, in QFT, it's, uh, it, it's, it goes under the name of uh, Ferry's theorem. And it, it really just follows from uh, charge conjugation. The fact that you're looking at three uh, different photons and, um, um, and, and you're looking at this three point amplitude, which is uh, uh, odd under that. So now we're just uh, seeing this in, in a very simple way. Okay, now here we talked about massless uh, spin one particles, but we'll be able to do exactly the same thing when we talk about uh, massive particles uh, probably tomorrow. Okay, so one more amplitude, one more three point amplitude that I want to uh, uh, talk about just a little bit because it's uh, it's it's a very important one is the coupling of uh, two fermions in a vector so two spin one half fermions and a spin one uh, particle so this is uh, schematically of this form and suppose let's uh, pick certain helicities so. Uh, this guy, the fermions are going to be one and two, and the vector is going to be three. So suppose I look at one plus two minus and three plus. So the sum of helicities in this case 
is uh, positive. So this means that we are in a square uh, in, a, in a square bracket kinematics. Um, and the amplitude in this case, we just wrote down all the amplitudes yesterday. So uh, we can just substitute in the helicities and find that this goes like um, this goes like uh, one three squared divided by one two. Now again, we can look at uh, the dimensionality of this thing. So this thing has dimension one, and so uh, this thing has dimension zero. So it's a renormalizable coupling, which is consistent with uh, having uh, a gauge coupling here. Um, so so that's the structure of this uh, amplitude. Now you can ask. You know, if I'm talking about some gauge theory, I really want to uh, see the fact that this gauge coupling here uh, is equal to the three gluon in some non-abelian theory. I want to see the relationship, the relation between this coupling and, and this coupling here. And in order to do that, uh, we would need to uh, look at uh, some four-point amplitude, which involves, for example, something like this. So this will this will become clear when we uh, talk about four point amplitudes a little later today. Now there is another coupling that I can construct, or I can consider a different set of helicities for the fermions and the vector. I can take them all to be uh, same helicity. So in this case, um, again substituting into the expressions that we had yesterday. What we're going to get is some C prime times one, three, two, three. And now looking at the dimension, at the dimension of this thing, uh, we see that this is dimension two. So uh, this guy has to uh, have dimension minus one. So it's got to go like some one over lambda, where lambda is some uh, mass scale. And you recognize this as the uh, dipole interaction between two fermions uh, and a vector. So you know that the dipole interaction goes like uh, psi bar sigma mu nu psi f mu nu, which is dimension five and comes with a one over lambda. So we get exactly the right thing. Okay. Um, so there are, of course, you can complete the list. We, we wrote down the most general uh, three um, three particle um, massless amplitudes, and you can play with that and see what happens when you uh, include uh, scalars. And uh, these are just two uh, examples that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to show. Okay, so uh, now we want to move on and talk about something a little more uh, interesting, which is the uh, four point amplitudes or or actually in uh, some endpoint amplitudes with n starting at four. So and and we're just restricting our attention for now to three amplitudes. Uh, hopefully today we're gonna get to loop amplitudes too. So for the three amplitudes, the amplitude, as we said, is a cup is a function of the couplings, of course the polarizations and the Lorentz invariance SIJ. And I'm putting SIJ here because I want these guys to stand collectively for higher point uh, amplitudes for any, for, for some uh, bigger combination of uh, momenta. So for example, here uh, I can have something like, you know, P1 plus P2 up to some P uh, I the whole thing uh, squared. But um, just for simplicity, I'm going to call all of them uh, SIJ. Okay. Um, and as for the polarizations, we said that we're going to, we can express that, we can express those guys at the end of the day uh, dotted between themselves or with the momenta uh, in terms of uh, these uh, spinner products. In any case, the amplitude is some rational function of uh, all these products, of the um, spinner products and of the uh, SIJs, 
where by this I mean either the um, square bracket or the angle bracket. Okay, so the important point for now um, and, and the main thing in this game is to think about the analytic properties of the amplitude. And we know that for these three amplitudes, the only sort of singularities we have are simple poles. And the simple poles arise when we have uh, some propagator that goes on shell. So we have some uh, amplitude and there's some uh, internal propagator that goes on shell. Let's say this is uh, one, two, to some M uh, and this is M plus one to N. Remember all my um, moments are incoming. And so here we have, let's call this guy P. Um, so we have uh, a propagator one over P squared here, which is one over P one plus P N squared. And um, sorry, P M squared. Uh, and I'm gonna denote this guy one over S one M. And when this uh, P squared uh, goes to zero, we know that uh, we, we get a simple pole and we also know how the amplitude factorizes. We know that in this case, essentially what happens is that uh, the amplitude factorizes into uh, this left part here times the right part here. So we know the uh, residue of the, of the amplitude of this pole. The residue is equal to uh, M uh, of uh, P1 to PM and this momentum P times, uh, let me call this guy ML, the guy on the left, times MR of uh, minus P uh, PM plus one to PN. And essentially the, the reason we know all this is because of uh, locality. I mean, we can't have any interactions that go like one over the momenta squared. So the only poles we can have are these uh, simple poles. And, um, and, and we know the um, amplitude factorizes in this way uh, on the simple poles. So this is going to be the thing we'll use over and over and over again, um, the whole time. Uh, and, and you know very well that if you have uh, an analytic function, if we have some analytic function, and we know all the poles and the residues, all the pole locations and the residues, then we can essentially uh, determine the function. Um, it, there are some, I mean, usually we, we need to know something about what the function does at infinity, but assuming that it's well behaved uh, and there are no residues at infinity, we can really determine the function uh, based on uh, all this information that uh, we have. So, in, in principle, you can do this uh, brute force. If you can look at some amplitude, uh, look at the different possible factorization channels, uh, think about how you calculate the residues, and in principle, uh, you should be able to determine the amplitude fully. But of course, this is not so simple in this case because um, we have th this function, the amplitude is a function of uh, many variables, right? There are many SIJs involved. And there's always the question of, you know, how do you know that you completely nail down uh, the full amplitude? But uh, in principle, it can be done. Uh, it, it can be done and it's something that uh, uh, people have used uh, uh, already a long time ago uh, 
probably starting with uh, uh, Bern, Dixon, and Kosower in in the nineties in the nineties, uh, not just for tree amplitudes but also for loop amplitudes, uh, as we'll see later today. But um, today we're also going to uh, see some some simpler ways to um, um, to address this problem. So again, the problem is that there are many um, of these very many complex variables involved. And in principle, there are many factorization channels that contribute. So I can consider S channel or a T channel or U channel scattering. If we have endpoint amplitudes, of course, there are uh, many factorization channels that uh, can contribute. And so it just becomes uh, technically complicated. And you want to see if you have some way of uh, disentangling the problem. So the plan for today, or the plan for the the plan for the uh, first part of uh, this lecture, is uh, going to be to start with uh, four point amplitudes, which are the simplest case. Uh, first of all, just try to do some brute force uh, guessing, um, and this will give us uh, the missing part of the. Um, of the young mill story, the Jacobi identity uh, that we're missing from the uh, Lee group story. So we'll sort of rediscover young mills in this way. Um, and then we'll see that it's actually a good idea to organize things somewhat and disentangle the, uh, the color structure of the amplitude. So we'll talk about color ordering. And then we're going to um, briefly talk about um, BCFW, which is uh, sort of a, a more recent or modern method of uh, organizing the problem and converting it essentially to a single um, complex variable instead of all the different SIJs. So that's the, that's the plan. Okay, so um, let's start with talking about uh, four points. And again, the thing that we want to do for now is just talk about um, messless spin one particles. So uh, what we have in mind are gluons or something that you can think about as uh, gluons. Um, and we're imagining that we have n of these guys, and we'll just look at uh, two to two scattering. So let's say we have two gluons scattering to, to, into two gluons of the same helicity. So the thing we want to, the object we want to look at is this amplitude that has uh, one with uh, index A and helicity minus. Well, actually, I'm switching. Um, I'm, I'm switching my conventions from here to here, so I really mean minuses here everywhere, um, and then two b minus three c plus and four d plus. Okay, so we already know what to do. The first thing that we need to do is we need to look at the little group scaling. So this thing carries uh, a certain helicity weights for the uh, minus helicity guy, this minus helicity guy, and, and these two positive helicity gluons. And um, therefore, we know that the amplitude has to be proportional to one, two squared times three, four squared. So one, two angle squared times three, four square squared. So that's just follows from the fact that remember that for each, um, each particle of helicity HI, um, we, the amplitude uh, carries helicity weight 
is carries little weight to HI. So I need to have one appear twice with an angle, similarly for two, and three, for example, has to appear twice uh, with a square. Okay, so now uh, what else can there be in this amplitude? Uh, there can be some function of uh, S12 and S13. This is just the four point amplitude. So there are only two independent uh, Lorentz invariants. We know that S12 plus S13 plus S23 equals zero. And of course, I need to put some, I need to put the indices A, B, C, D on this function F. And um, looking at dimensions, this factor here has dimension four. This is a four point amplitude. So it has dimension zero. So um, this, um, so this function here has to be dimensionless. And so we know that um, the only things that can appear in this FABCD is I, I can write it, I can pull out some, uh, I can pull out some uh, factor outside, for example, um, I could write it as one over S12 times one over S13, and then it's gonna be just a function of dimensionless ratios like this. Okay. Um, now, the thing that we're going to use is exactly the thing that we mentioned before. We know that uh, the only singularities that this uh, amplitude has are simple poles when some of the, when some propagator goes on shell. So that corresponds to S12 going to zero or S13 going to zero and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I got a bit confused. The amplitude, it's dimensionless, and then on the right-hand side, you have something which is dimension four, and that's it? I mean... Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, 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 right. Um, thank you. This one I heard. So you're right, of course, here, uh, I wanted four. to say yeah, okay. that this F has dimension minus four. Yes, okay. Yeah, which makes sense with the scaling you put after, but okay, thank you. <laughs> right, right. I, yeah, thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, please complain. Uh, so I had a question about what do you mean by uh, factorization channels, and in particular, do you mean it's like the ways you can cut the diagram, or is it something else? Okay, so what I mean by this is uh, let let's think about this example. <clears throat> so I know that. Uh, in, in the back of my mind, okay, or, or not in the back of my mind, I know that this amplitude is coming from uh, a bunch of Feynman diagrams, just the usual story. Uh, and so I know that the, I know that the different factorization channels just correspond to each one of these propagators going on shell. Okay, so you mean it's just the fact that you can have U channel, less channel, and, and so on. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. In general, um, for any amplitude that you're that we're thinking about, there there are a bunch of Feynman diagrams that contribute to that, uh, and each one of the internal propagators uh, in those can go on shell, and so that's what I mean by factorization channels. Any more questions? Okay, good. Okay, so um, 
So let's go back. Um, right. So we want to look at the um, we want to look at the uh, structure of this um, the structure of this uh, amplitude here. Let me clean things up a bit. Okay. So um, essentially, what I what I want to do now is um, I I want to use the fact that I already calculated the three point uh, amplitudes for for three gluons. So these guys we already calcul calculated. I want to remind you what the uh, answer was. So we had uh, this expression. This was equal to G F A B C one three cubed divided by two one two three. Okay. And so uh now I can just consider the uh the different poles uh, that arise in this amplitude. So for example, uh, we're gonna have a pole as S12 goes to zero. As S12 uh, goes to zero, we have, this is our, this is what I mean by a factorization channel. Um, so I have one, two, three, four here. Uh, this is A, B, C, and D. And essentially, in this case, the amplitude factorizes to the product of this guy times this guy. And for these two guys, I have the expression that we derived uh, last time. So let me now put some uh, uh, indices here. So this is going to be the momentum P flowing in here. Let me take it in this direction, and let me also put an index E <clears throat> for this uh, internal line. And now I can just uh, make an ansatz uh, for this amplitude as P squared goes to zero. And of course, P in this case is just P1 is actually minus P is equal to P1 plus P2. Okay. So um, in this case, I know what the uh, residue uh, is. The residue is just the product of the two uh, amplitudes, the one on the left and the, the one on the right. So um, the, we, we can just glue together these uh, two amplitudes. We have uh, an F, E, A, B on one side times um, one, two cubed divided by one P, two P. And then on the other side, we have uh, F, E, C, D up to a plus or minus that I'm not going to really keep track of. Uh, and here I have four, three cubed divided by minus p3 uh, minus p4. Okay, um, maybe it's going to help if we draw this to draw this again. So we have this times this, uh, and we had one, two, this was a minus, this was a minus, this was p coming in. So uh, the only option for this guy is a plus because <clears throat> we already have two minuses. So the third guy needs to be a plus. <coughs> and therefore, on the other side, this was plus, this was uh, four, and this was three plus. Uh, and here, what we have coming in is a minus p with helicity minus because I'm changing this line from uh, going in this direction to this direction. So the helicity. Uh, 
effects, which is sine. Okay, so now I have an ansatz. So this is the residue. This is the residue uh, is uh, for the one over p squared pole, where this one over p squared is one over s12. So now I have an ansatz for the amplitude. I have a simple ansatz that I can write down. I can write the amplitude as one over s12 times um, times this product here. Okay, uh, and I guess I forgot the uh, there is a g here. And there is a g here, so all together is that there is a g squared. Okay, now of course I could have things that uh, uh, go to zero uh, as s one two goes to zero. I I don't know anything about uh, these guys, but um, up to these guys, this is the ansatz that uh, we can make. So. Altogether, the thing that we get from this is one over s one two, one two cubed, four three cubed divided by. Uh, so what do we have here? We have um, okay. I need to tell you a little bit of. Uh, so before we go on, uh, here I have this. Um, I have these. Uh, um, spinner products that involve a minus p. So we need to have some convention with what to do about this uh, minus p here. Now, remember the one thing that we do need is we know that uh, the momentum p is equal to p, p. So I want minus p, minus p uh, to be minus p, p. And now we can choose uh, whatever phase we want for, for these guys. We can choose an I here uh, or um, something else. But the simplest thing we can do is just take this guy to be equal to, let's say, minus P. And uh, minus P will stay uh, the same. OK, in any case, we have this happening twice. So these two minuses are going to cancel and we don't need to worry about this uh, at this point. So altogether, um, let me um, just uh, collect these pieces in the denominator. So we have one P times P3 and two P times P4. And then this thing I can write as one P3. And then I can use uh, momentum conservation and play with this some more. And I'm not going to do this here. But at the end of the day, you can show that you'll get 1, 2 uh, squared, 3, 4 squared divided by S1, 2, S1, 3. OK, so this again is an exercise. Uh, please verify that this is what you get. But now let's uh, now let's look at what uh, what we got here. So we looked at uh, this particular um, factorization channel, the S one two factorization channel, and we found something that has the S one two pole here, like we expect. But it looks uh, pretty funny because there's also this uh, uh, S13 pole, uh, which also appeared. So it doesn't look quite right because instead of getting something that just has a simple pole, we seem to be getting a double pole. So there's something that we need to do about this. Um, now, to some extent, uh, you could have expected that because remember we have this uh, function here, uh, f a b c d, and as we know, it has dimension minus four. So if I if there is no other scale in the problem, then we already said the 
the ansatz for this guy is this F has to be, you know, maybe, maybe I need, I, I certainly need two powers of some Sij here. So it's not too surprising that I get S12 times S13 times something that's dimensionless. So I shouldn't be too surprised that I got this uh, funny factor here. Okay. Um, now, let's, um, so, so let's uh, look at this ansatz uh, a little more. So as we said before, we, we can write this as some function of S12 over S13, uh, where because the, the whole thing is a rational function, this is going to be some uh, polynomial in this ratio S12 over S13. But of course, we can't have any ratio appear here or any, any power of uh, S12 over S13 because we're going to get poles that, are, that, that involve too high a power of the, uh, of the S13. So the simplest ansatz or the only ansatz we can make for this uh, function is 1, 2 squared, 3, 4 squared times some constant divided by S12, S13 plus uh, S12, S23 plus A3, S13, S23. So this is an ansatz that has the hope of giving us uh, the right behavior. And, and now let's uh, play with this ansatz. So again, let me look again at the S12 pole. So S12 is going to zero. As S12 goes to zero, we know that S23 uh, is equal to minus S13. So if I'm looking at the residue of the S12 pole, there is a contribution from this term here, and there is a contribution from this term here, but uh, S23 is equal to minus S13. So I find that A1 minus A2 is equal to G squared times FABE, FCBE. And I forgot to put the two Fs here. We had the two Fs before, and I, um, sorry, I forget that I said that. That's not what I wanted to say. Um, this is just coming from the fact that as S12 goes to zero, I know that the amplitude has to factorize on these, uh, on the product of these three, of these three point amplitudes that we wrote down before. So we get uh, this result. So uh, we get this for S12 going to zero. And similarly, if we look at the S13 pole, we're going to find that uh, A3 minus A1 is um, given by the appropriate combination of uh, Fs. And similarly for uh, the S23 pole, which is going to give us A2 minus A3 equals G squared, blah, blah, blah. So now if we just add up everything on the left-hand side, we get zero. And we see that we have uh, A, F, A, B, E, F, C, D, E, plus F, A, C, E, F, B, D, E, plus F, A, D, E, F, B, C, E, give zero. And this is, as advertised before, the Jacobi identity. So what happened here was that we looked at the four-point amplitude for uh, four, four of these uh, spin one massless particles. And we find that in order to get the correct uh, poles for the amplitude, in order for it to factorize in the S12 channel, S13 channel, and S23 channel correctly, uh, these Fs cannot be anything. They're not only anti-symmetric, they also have to satisfy this uh, identity. Um, so so that's, that, that completes the story of how we see the Lie group structure uh, by, by looking at, it, at, the, um, at this uh, scattering. So 
we learned that the um, the the spin one particles that we have here have to have interactions of a very very specific form. Their three points have to go like uh, these FABCs, and these are exactly the structure constants of Lie group. Okay, so let's see if there are any questions at this point. Okay, great. Okay, very good. Um, okay, notice the things that went into this are, as we said, the correct analytic properties of the uh, amplitude, but also the fact that um, these are bosons, right? We did use spin statistics to say that the kinematic part has to be completely, if the kinematic part is completely anti-symmetric, the, um, the FABC also has to be completely anti-symmetric. Okay, so uh, now let's rewrite the thing that we found um, one more way, or actually I'm not going to uh, rewrite it, but uh, I'll ask you to do it as an exercise. So I'm, I'm gonna take one piece, the piece that we looked at before, the one, two squared, three, four squared, divided by S12, S13. And I want you to show that you can write that as two, one cubed, divided by two, three, three, four, four, one. So this is something, sorry, four, two. So this is something that you can recognize as the MHV amplitudes that we wrote down before. We wrote this, uh, um, we wrote the maximally helicity violating amplitudes uh, for some higher n, we said that it's uh, <clears throat> of the form um, one to cubed divided by um, two, three, two. Sorry, let me let me do one more. Um, change this to a four and and put a one here. So this was in general for some a n, where one and two are negative and everyone else is positive. And we see that we get uh, exactly this form for, um, for this term that we have here. Now, I, I think I already told you that secretly there is some, this is not really the full story, this corresponds to a particular color ordering. So now let's... Uh, um, now let's talk uh, about that uh, a little more. Okay, but actually before we talk about uh, color ordering, let me make some uh, more comments. So, uh, so this is first of all an exercise. You should convince yourself that this is what you get. Um, and, and now let's uh, make some more comments before we talk about color ordering. So. The first thing I want to talk about is, are there more terms that are possible uh, in, in the ansatz? So remember the thing that we said is that our amplitude has to have the form that I wrote down here, something like this. And what this really assumed is that there is no other scale in the problem. There is no scale in the problem. Um, so the only dimensional quantities we have are the um, are the momenta. Now, then you can think what happens if there is another scale in the problem. So suppose we have some uh, effective theory, and there is some higher order scale lambda. In this case, of course, we can have uh, more structure. We can have things like one, two squared, three, four squared times one over lambda to the fourth times P, A, B, C, D of S, one, two over lambda squared 
and S13 over lambda squared. And this can be some polynomial. So here we're only allowing uh, non-negative powers of uh, S12 and S13. Now, of course, this thing has no, uh, has no poles. So it's not going to contribute to any poles or any residues. Uh, and there's no way we could have uh, inferred it by the factorization that we talked about before. But that's fine. That's exactly what we expect because uh, this is exactly what an EFT should do, right? It should just give you a bunch of new couplings that enter, um, in this case, at the level of the four point. And um, we, and, and, and it's okay. I mean, they're just there and they, we, we cannot say anything about them based on the poles that we considered before. Now, if you start thinking about that, you could ask yourself, um, and this is the second comment I want to make, you could ask yourself the following question. You know that if you do, if you calculate the four gluon amplitude uh, using Feynman diagrams, then there are these diagrams that you have to include. But then there's also the one coming from the four gluon vertex, right? That's, that's also there. And we never, had, we never had to say anything about it, right? I mean, we just infer the amplitude by looking at uh, these guys, uh, the factorizable part of the amplitude. But we didn't have to say anything about this uh, four gluon vertex. So, uh, so how come? I mean, why didn't we have to say anything about that? So let's. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll come back to this question. But before we do that, um, I do want to talk about color ordering. Okay. So now we can pretend. Now we can say, okay, we've discovered uh, Yang Mills. We know everything about QCD. We can go back to everything we know about QCD and discuss color ordering. So color ordering is something that almost completes the set of tools that are uh, so useful for calculating perturbative QCD amplitudes, uh, whether you use Feynman diagrams or not. Um, and it also allows you to square, do the color sums very, very easily. So the uh, trick is uh, very simple. Uh, usually, if you're used to working with FABCs in your Feynman rule, what you want to do is just replace FABC by minus i over square root of 2. And that depends, of course, on your conventions for the generators. <clears throat> uh, the trace of T a t b t c minus the trace t a <clears throat> t c t b and if you replace every f a b c by this combination of generators um you can write your uh endpoint n gluon uh tree level amplitude is a sum over traces so it takes the form g to the n minus 2, a sum over non-cyclic permutations, uh, the trace of Ta sigma 1 to Ta sigma n <clears throat> times a n uh, of uh, sigma 1 to sigma n. In other words, you have a notion of ordering. You break up your amplitude into uh, a bunch of traces, and the things and the amplitudes multiplying each one of these traces uh, is ordered accor according to the ordering of generators uh, in the trace. So for example, if I'm looking at trace Ta, one to T A N, then it corresponds to one, two, three, up to N. The 
ordering of the gluons is dictated. And in particular, uh, one and two, if TA1 is adjacent to TA2 here, then gluon one has to be adjacent to gluon, T, to gluon two here. And you see that this tells you that for each one of these color orderings, not all the factorization channels can appear, but only the ones where gluons that are adjacent to each other uh, can come together. <clears throat> so for example, here, I can have something like this, but I'm not gonna have a propagator that involves gluon two and gluon four. This is just not gonna be there. Okay, now, of course, the only reason this is, uh, this is useful is that each one of these uh, color ordered amplitudes uh, is separately gauge invariant. So there is a sense in which we can talk about them. Um, and so this is something that's very useful to do. And as I said, it also gives you, when you, when you take the uh, squares of these, uh, uh, when you take the square of the amplitudes in this, in this way, you have some uh, um, simple squaring rules that you can use to do the color sums. Um, a, a good place to read about that is the review by Mangano and Park that contains a lot of these uh, useful relations. Okay, so that's all I wanted to uh, say about uh, color ordering. But now we can go back to our four gluon amplitude and, um, and, and even the, the general MHV expression that we had and, and sort of understand that a little better. So I told you before for the MHV amplitudes that, yeah, sure. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I just wanted to ask if the color ordering is essentially rewriting the structure constant, or uh, is it something else? Yeah, so I th the, the way to derive that is just to uh, write the FABCs uh, as these combinations. And when you do that, you can rewrite uh, the amplitudes in terms of traces. So you're trading, in, in general, you, you can have uh, lots of FABCs appear, right? So you'll have a product of F FABCs and you'll have to use this uh, relation uh, a few times, but at the end of the day, you'll be able to convert all of them to just uh, traces with a particular ordering. And uh, and in relation to that, what happens to the I in the, you know, if you generalize... Oh, this I here? Yep. Yep. I'm not, I wasn't keeping track of that. Okay. Uh, there is going to be some, you know, it's going to be absorbed in this prefactor. So all I'm telling you really, maybe let's... Uh, say this again, what I'm telling you is that um, I can, I can take my, I can take my um, amplitude, the amplitude uh, has some indices A1 to AN, and I can write it as uh, some trace of TA1 to TAN times a one to n plus permutations of that. And in this prefactor of the trace, uh, the gluons have to be adjacent, the, the gluons have to appear in this ordering, right? So the, in this thing here, I have the ordering one to up to n. I can't, I can't exchange one and three. So any prefactors, if there was some i, that there are many i's and minuses and squares of twos and so on and so forth, these are all gonna um, come into this uh, a. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. 
Any more questions before we go on? Okay, good. So let's, uh, okay, so, so the little thing I wanted to add to what we said before about the MHV amplitudes is, you know, I told you that a n of uh, one minus two minus three plus two n plus is equal to this one two cubed divided by two three three four two n one and what this guy really is is the color ordered amplitude, namely it's the it's this amplitude here with the specific ordering of the gluons, uh, which is uh, multiplying this trace. Okay. Um, good. So now let's go back to this question that um, I raised before, which is what about the four gluon vertex? So what about this guy? Why did we never have to think about it? Um, so just to remind you, um, the Feynman rule for this guy goes, let, let me not worry about factors of minuses and i's and so on and so forth. So there's some g squared times two uh, f's, two fabcs times g mu rho. So, okay, this, this has some uh, mu nu rho sigma. So this is uh, g mu rho g nu sigma and other permutations of this guy. So when we, when we have this, uh, when we have this thing contribute to the uh, four point amplitude, what's going to happen is that the uh, polarization vectors are going to be dotted into each other. So this is just going to involve uh, epsilon one dot epsilon two, epsilon three dot epsilon four, plus permutations of that. So what I want you to do is an exercise. So this is an exercise is to show uh, two things. First of all, that you can choose reference momenta or reference spinners uh, such that this contribution vanishes. Um, and the other thing that um, you can show, which is a little more complicated, is that all the uh, all the all plus um, so all plus amplitudes also vanish and um, the minus plus plus amplitudes also vanish uh, by some choice of uh, reference uh, by, by some choice of uh, reference spinners. So um, this is this is harder, but uh, the main thing you should convince yourself of is that this guy you can really get rid of, and it's by virtue of gauge invariance. So essentially, gauge invariance lets us uh, set this uh, contribution to zero completely. And we, we don't need to worry about that. Now, this is uh, something that we, again, could have expected uh, just based on the gauge symmetry. So we know that in the, in the gauge theory, in the Young-Mills theory, we have the three gluon vertex and we have the four gluon vertex. Uh, but the relation between them, the fact that, you know, this comes with a G and an FABC, and then this guy goes like a G squared with a very particular structure, this, this structure is completely determined by gauge invariance. So the symmetry of the theory 
um, completely dictates uh, this contact term once we specify uh, this three gluon vertex. And so there's nothing, there's no new information in this uh, four gluon vertex. Um, it doesn't tell us anything new about the theory that the uh, that that we didn't know before. Uh, and so therefore, in in this way of constructing the amplitude, we can really just uh, use the factorization on the three point amplitudes, and there's no new information in this uh, in this contact term in this contact uh, vertex of uh, four gluons. Now that's to be contrasted with the um, things that we talked about a little while ago. We said that you know if we had some uh, new contributions from some higher dimension operators, we could have some terms appear here that um, that don't contribute to the poles, and we couldn't infer anything about them uh, based on the poles. So that's completely new information. These are new couplings that are not related to the three-point couplings that we had in the theory before. They could arise as new contact terms at the level of uh, uh, four-point amplitudes. And um, therefore, there is uh, we, 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 of course, uh, do need to have, th they come in as new inputs to the theory. OK. Um, so, OK, I think that's what um, I wanted to say about um, constructing this uh, constructing this uh, four gluon amplitudes from three points. Any more questions before we go on? You can listen to me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, when you thought, uh, say about uh, residues, uh, you have the equation of, uh, where we have a sum of uh, A1, A2, A3, yeah, but it's, you, you, you understand me? Uh, I could, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, here. Uh, what? But uh, I don't understand what is the uh, A1 point, uh, A2 point. These oh, diagrams, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I sure. didn't understand. So these were just, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I said this clearly. So these were just constants, okay? Ah, okay, okay. I, th these are constants that I don't know uh, a priori. So okay, what, no. we mm -hmm. could, uh, what we could, what we... So, so the point is that the discussion that we had before allows us to conclude that this is a good ansatz for the amplitude. Okay, it has um, it has something that can give us the correct pole structure, um, and is not going to result in in poles that are unacceptable, like you know have very high powers of the SIJs appear here. So at this point, we're just making an ansatz. We're saying. Let's guess um, this form, which is a sensible form. And these are three constants, OK? And then at the next stage, we um, look at each one of the poles. For example, we look at S12 going to 0. As S12, as S12 goes to 0, I know that I should get uh, this 1 to P amplitude times the P three, four amplitude, okay? And so that tells me that the residue uh, is going to be equal to this times this combination of uh, G squared and uh, two Fs. And on the other hand, so, so I have to look at this expression, this ansatz, I have to look at the pole. The S12 pole is coming, first of all, from here, and it's contributing um, A1 divided by S13 
times one, two squared, three, four squared. And then there is uh, A2 divided by S23. And I use the fact that, they're, that they have the opposite sign. So I know what A1 minus A2 has to be equal to. So that's, that's the exercise. But originally, when I just make this ansatz, then A1 and A2 and A3 are just constants. Okay, thank you, I get, because I think there's um, some relaxation of the amplitude, so I'm be a little bit confused, but now I understand uh, much better. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and actually, maybe one, maybe another thing to add here is that essentially what happened here was that everything was lumped together because we didn't color order anything. Um, we just had all possible orderings of the gluons contribute. When we look at the color ordered amplitudes, then we're not going to have all the possible orderings contribute, but instead, you know, if I, if I look at uh, the amplitude with one, two, three, four, then I can have this channel that I talked about before. Uh, and I can also have um, this pole, but I'm not going to have the U channel, because here I'm exchanging the ordering of the of the gluons. So we, when we look at the color ordered amplitude, we're breaking things up into, uh, we're we're keeping track of the ordering, and not all the factorization channels are going to contribute to a single color ordered amplitude. Okay. Um, good. So there is one more tool that we're not going to have time to talk about, but I do want to mention it because it's, uh, it's very important and it's something that you can hear about uh, very often in this game, and that is uh, supersymmetry. So this will be very brief, but I think uh, I, I will just mention it. So the big, um, the big surprise is that if you think about this uh, n-gluon amplitude, for example, it's an n-gluon tree amplitude, it's actually supersymmetric. And the reason is it's supersymmetric is that uh, if you had supersymmetry, then you you know that uh, you have also the gluino in the game, and the gluino is a spin one half uh, particle. But the only way, because it's a fermion, the only way it can enter the amplitude is either it comes in. So we have all these gluons, right? And if we were to have a gluino, then either this gluino has to come in and come out on the other side because it's a fermion, or uh, it can appear as a closed loop. So the gluino can also appear here as a closed loop. But if we're just talking about tree amplitudes, there's no way it can enter. Uh, and this holds more generally, uh, not just for gluons, but also for uh, quark amplitudes. So that means that if we're just Thinking of tree amplitudes, we can use, um, we, we can, it's the same amplitude that you're going to get uh, as if you were working in a supersymmetric theory. Now, we already saw that uh, Lorentz gave us many constraints uh, on the amplitude. In the case of supersymmetry, we have an ex extension of uh, Lorentz. So, of course, it would imply even more constraints on the amplitude. 
And these constraints um, lead to what is usually referred to as the supersymmetric word identities, which is just what you expect, right? Because you have uh, a, a bigger symmetry uh, in the story. And essentially what they allow you to do is they allow you to relate uh, gluon amplitudes to gluino amplitudes and vice versa. Of course, when I say gluino, um, yeah, I, I really mean gluino in this case. So um, it allows you to relate uh, gluon amplitudes to gluino amplitudes, similarly for quarks and squarks. And so you can uh, um, get even more information about your uh, amplitudes, and that can be extended to the uh, loop level too. So I, we don't have too much time to talk about that, but uh, I just wanted to say uh, I just wanted to say this. Okay, um, very good. So what we saw. Um, what what we saw now are things that we can say, or, or actually some examples in which we can uh, get the four point amplitude from three point amplitudes uh, using the analytical properties of the four point amplitude, um, and. Essentially, as, as we already said, this is something that we can do quite generally in many cases. We can uh, construct a n from lower point amplitudes. Um, and this was already used uh, back in the back in the 90s even. Um, actually, one type of uh, relations like this that are uh, very powerful and were used very early on are the soft and collinear limits. So what do we mean by that? So suppose we have some amplitude with, uh, let's say, one, two, three n legs. And now we can consider the limit that P1 goes to zero, or that uh, P1 and P2 are collinear. And in each one of these uh, limits, what's going to happen is that if we have some contribution where one, two are connected to the rest of the amplitude by, by this propagator, then this propagator is going to go uh, on shell. And then the amplitude is going to factorize into this uh, n minus one point amplitude times uh, a three point amplitude like this with the one over p squared. <clears throat> so this is kind of a special case of the types of things that we discussed. But of course, this is the only case when you know p1 goes to zero or these two guys are collinear. This is the only case in which this uh, three-point amplitude is actually physical. We can take all the momenta to be real because uh, it's this um, singular kinematics where you know one one momentum just goes to zero, or all the momenta are parallel to each other. So uh, you can think of this as a special case of the things that we already discussed. Okay, so. So far, we just saw a very brute force of uh, gluing three-point amplitudes together into a four-point amplitude. But now we want to um, turn to uh, sort of a nicer and more elegant way to do this, in which you uh, turn the amplitude into a function of a single complex uh, variable. So if we somehow can turn the amplitude into a function of a single complex variable. And if we know the poles and residues of this uh, amplitude as a function of this variable z, then we 
can determine the amplitude, right? That's something that you know from your um, complex uh, analysis class. So if AZ is well behaved at infinity, if uh, as Z goes to infinity, A goes to zero sufficiently fast. And if I know all the poles and all the residues um, at each one of the poles that are, uh, let's say that each residue is equal to CI, then I can simply write down the expansion of the uh, amplitude. It's just given by a sum over all the poles, CI, Z minus ZI. So if we can um, arrive at an expression like this, then we can really fully determine the amplitude. So this is going to be what we uh, discuss now. Okay, and so this goes uh, back to the work by uh, Brito, Cachazo, Feng, and Witten. This is uh, from 2005. Um, and what they were able to do uh, using this method is to uh, actually calculate all the uh, n gluon tree amplitudes. Okay, so let's talk about how that works. So that usually goes under the name of BCFW or BCFW shift. Okay, so what's the idea? So we're thinking of some amplitude um, that involves an external legs. And the idea is to introduce this complex variable Z into the game. So the way they do this is they take each momentum, uh, or not each momentum, they take some momenta or all momenta, and um, shift them as follows. You shift them by uh, Z times some uh, four vector Ri. So Z is a complex number. And this Ri is some uh, four vector. And it cannot be any set of Ri's. There's a bunch of things that we want them to satisfy. So we want the sum over all the Ri's to be zero. We want our i dot rj also to be zero, and we also want pi dot ri to be zero for all i. Okay, now we don't, I mean, usually you don't shift all the momenta in this way, so many of the r's can just vanish. Uh, as we'll see the in the original uh, BCFW paper, they just uh, shifted two momenta. <coughs> um, but, but this is the most general thing that you uh, can consider. So because, because of everything, because of all these conditions on the Rs, uh, these shifted momenta also behave like uh, good momenta. They satisfy, first of all, that the sum of the pi hat um, is uh, zero. So we still have momentum conservation in terms of the hatted momenta, the shifted momenta. And we also have that pi hat squared um, is zero. So they're still light-like. Um, and so now we can consider the new uh, amplitude, the hatted amplitude, which is the amplitude in terms of this uh, of the shifted momenta. So this looks like a, a good, uh, honest amplitude uh, just in these uh, shifted momenta. Okay. Uh, and usually, you know, it seems a little weird that these uh, new four momenta are entering the game, but in um, but what's going to happen usually is that these are just going to be given in terms of the momenta or the spinners that you already have in the problem. Okay. Um, so now if we look at this new 
uh, shifted amplitude, uh, this is now a function of z. So that was the whole point. And not only that, but we know that um, the only sort of um, singularities that it can have are again simple poles in z. And the way these simple poles are going to arise is they're going to arise when you have some propagator that goes on shell. Uh, this time, it's uh, a propagator that involves the shifted momenta. So, for example, I can have some pij hat squared that uh, is given by pi plus pi plus 1 plus pj, which, um, which uh, goes on shell, and, and the square of that uh, goes to 0. OK, now, of course, the thing that we are, we, we introduced this z into the game. We're looking for poles in z. So for this to be interesting, it has to depend on z, right? I mean, only in, in some cases, depending on which momenta I shift and how I shift them, it could be that this combination of uh, momenta does not uh, include z, in which case it's just not going to contribute any pole. So we're only interested in things where z uh, appears. Uh, if we write this explicitly, we can write this pij as uh, just the sum of pi plus pj for the original momenta plus z times uh, ri plus rj. So we're only going to be interested in contributions such that this thing is not is non-zero. And we can call uh, this guy, this is going to be pij, and this thing we can call rij. Okay, so when does this, uh, so, so we're interested in situations when this pij squared equals zero. Um, and again, pij is the sum of this uh, pij and rij. So remember that all the ri dot rj's, uh, they all vanish. So when we take the square of this, there are two combinations. There's pij squared, and then there's 2z times pij dot rij. So uh, where is the pole going to be? The pole is going to be at z equals zij, which is minus 1 half uh, pij squared divided by pij dot rij. Okay, so just to uh, look at this pictorially, what do we have? We have um, we have a factorization like this. Where this was i hat, and this is i plus one hat and this is j hat, um, and this guy here is this p i j hat. And what we know is, we know that um, near the pole, near z i j, what the amplitude, um, what the amplitude does is it behaves like the amplitude on the left, a l hit this guy here. Uh, it's z equals z i j times one over p i j squared um, times a r. It's z equals z i j. Okay, so now let's write this. Uh, propagator that we have here. So this propagator that we have here uh, is pij squared 
let me just write the, yeah, let me write the whole propagator. So it's Pij squared uh, plus 2z Pij dot Rij. So I can pull out this factor of uh, 2 Pij dot Rij um, and rewrite this thing as uh, z plus um, Pij squared <clears throat> over 2 Pij dot Rij. And after a little bit of algebra, this is just going to become Zij over Pij squared, 1 over Z minus Zij. OK, so we now know the residue of uh, A hat of Z. It's Z equals Zij. It's equal to um, this factor here times AL times AR. So altogether, we have minus ZIJ, ALZ, 1 over PIJ squared, ARZ, it's Z equals ZIJ. Okay. Any questions about this, um, about what we did so far? Can you remember me, please, why Rij squared is equal to zero? Did you hear me? Um, why Ij? Rij. Rij -R 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 squared. It's equal to zero. Uh, why? Yeah. Okay. So. Thanks. Remember Rij, um, yeah, this was Rij. Rij is the sum of, sorry, Ri plus Ri plus one up to Rj. And the thing is that this is one of the conditions on the Rs. So Ri dot Rj equals zero for any R and J. So that's why Rij squared uh, is zero. Okay, good. Okay, so now we have this uh, unpleasant expression uh, for the residue, but it's just some, you know, it. It's just it's just some uh, algebra that's going on here, but we know at this point the thing is that we know the location of all the poles. All the poles are uh, the location of the poles are given here, and all the residues are given here. So now we're essentially done. Now we can write the amplitude. So the amplitude that we're interested in is our original amplitude. Uh, this is the headed amplitude at z equals zero. And so I'm interested, um, so, so here is the z plane, and we want the, um, and, and we're interested in the amplitude at zero. Let me, let me do another step before, uh, going on. So I can write this guy is uh, 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over this thing, az over z dz. So the thing that I did here is to look at um, a hat z over z. Um, I want this guy at the origin. So I'm taking a closed contour C around it. Uh, 
this is the this will give me the original amplitude that I'm interested in. And of course, this thing, uh, AZ, this function AZ over Z, it has poles in other locations here. These are all the ZIs that we found before with the residues that we know. So I can deform this contour and um, it's just gonna pick up the poles at each one, uh, around each one of these, um, it's just going to pick up the residues around each one of these uh, other poles. Uh, and that's, of course, provided that I don't have any contribution from infinity, right? In principle, I need to deform this uh, contour through infinity, but uh, I'm assuming here that AZ goes to zero sufficiently fast at infinity. So, uh, what this thing is equal to is it's equal to the sum over all the poles, uh, 1 over 2 pi i uh, integral over c um, az over z dz. This is uh, over all the poles zi. And this is just going to give us the sum over all the poles uh, of the residue of uh, A at Z equals Z I uh, divided by, sorry, Z I J divided by <clears throat> Z I J. Remember the poles are labeled by I J because they had uh, the sum of momenta from P I to P J um, in the propagator that went on shell. So we now have uh, this expression for the amplitude, and now we can plug in the expression for the residues that we had before. So we had this expression for the residue. Uh, each residue at z i j gave us this factor. So now this guy is going to drop out, is going to cancel out, and we'll be left just by just with this thing. So what we find is uh, we find that this is equal to minus uh, the sum over all the poles uh, a oops, a l hit at z i j uh, one over p i j squared a r hit at z i j. Okay. And each one of these poles, again, corresponds to a particular factorization channel, like the one that we had over here. Okay, so essentially that's the end of the story, okay? Because at this point, what did we get? We found an expression for our endpoint amplitude, and it's given in terms of this uh, product of amplitude on the left and amplitude on the right, which are lower point uh, amplitudes. So we can calculate the amplitude recursively. So we have a recursion relation for A. And starting from the three points, we can uh, build our way up and bootstrap uh, the amplitudes. And each pole in A corresponds to a particular factorization channel with some um, sum of momenta um, becoming on shell. And the nice thing about this is that very often a lot of these are going to vanish. So a lot of these are not going to contribute. Um, and Another nice thing is that by introducing this Z, uh, we really were interested in, in poles in Z, but we've really separated the poles. So each factorization channel gives us uh, a, a pole, a pole in Z, of course, at a different location. Um, and 
the different locations are precisely these ZIJs that we uh, found before. Normally, generically, they're not going to uh, coincide with each other. Each one of them is going to lie at a different point in the plane. So this is very different from working with the SIJs where, you know, all the poles for massless particles, all, all the poles are at the origin. Um, now all the poles got separated in the Z plane. Okay, so this uh, sort of completes the, the uh, general story. It completes the method. Um, what I was also going to do is uh, show you the simplest uh, shift, the BCFW shift uh, as an example. So I think I'll do that uh, quickly tomorrow. And um, then the plan was to go on and discuss uh, um, the story for loop levels, generalized unitarity, uh, very briefly. So we'll still try to do that, I think, uh, and and then uh, move to massive amplitudes. Okay, so let me see if there are any questions before we finish. Um, I didn't understand exactly how you ensure that, like, you don't have degenerate poles, so poles that kind of merge in the z-plane. So, what is the condition that I guess something on the R eyes uh, ensures? Well, that? it's just, uh, so we we found the location of the poles. Uh, let me show this again. Um, this is where the poles are. So each one of the poles corresponds to, oops, go away. So each one of these poles corresponds to a particular factorization channel. And you see that for, for, for this particular factorization channel, for example, this is where the pole is. So it's given by, you know, this PI plus PI plus one plus PJ squared divided by uh, this Pij times Rij. Generically, these points are not going to be at the same place. Of course, you you know, you know can try to cook up some kinematics. Yeah, where, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. What I'm asking yeah. is how do I ensure that I, I'm not into this degenerate condition? Because I can play around with the Rs, no? I, would, I, I think you don't need to. I mean, you, you just assume that you have some generic uh, point in 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 phase space and you you derive the amplitude and you know you, you usually derive the amplitude assuming that your momenta are not doing something funny right if they did something funny then the amplitude would be doing something funny too presumably and so uh, you so so we our implicit assumption the whole time is that uh, we're sitting at some generic point in phase space where nothing funny is going on. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank you, El. Thank you. Okay, see you tomorrow. And we'll have a coffee break. Yep, see you tomorrow.